You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. I'm going to ask you to think of a number. It's a big number, and I mean really big. It's a number that is going to change the entire direction of China's economic policy. It's a number that is going to affect what age people in China are allowed to retire. It's a number that women in their 20s, 30s, and even 40s will have the power to influence. It might just be a number that is too controversial for Beijing's central government to make it public. So right now, close your eyes and try to imagine how many people are there in China right now. China has a lot of people, more than a billion, more than four times as many as the people who live in the United States. It's more than the populations of the U.S., South America, and Europe combined. And yes, there are more people in China than anywhere else in the world. But exactly, how many people? That's the question Beijing's central government tries to answer every ten years. Here, we are at the beginning of the 2020s, and the results are in. How many people live in China? Where do they live? Have they moved? How old are they? And are there more babies being born or less? And how exactly did they manage to count everyone in a country that stretches from the Gobi Desert, bordering Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan? Down to the Himalayas and all the way across to the tropical jungles on the border with Vietnam and Laos, and on the northeast border with Russia. And what can these numbers tell us? Welcome to Inside China. My name is Mimi Lau. It has been weeks of waiting, almost a month. Waiting for Beijing to release the official figures of the 2020 census. We started recording this podcast a few days ago when there was no indication that Beijing was going to actually release the figures. That changed this morning, and we have had a couple of hours to go through the figures. What has been released so far is the executive summary. So, if anything changes between me recording this podcast and you listening to it wherever you are in the world right now, keep in mind that more details, more analysis, and more news on the latest China census is coming to you over the next few days and weeks, and you will find the latest on scmp.com. Before we get into the complex social issues this census is revealing, let's go behind the scene and find out how the job was actually done. How do the Chinese officials count almost one and a half billion people? Sydney Leung sits at a desk about three meters from me, where I work at the South China Morning Post here in Hong Kong. Hey, Sydney. Hi, Mimi. So, first of all, with your story, you talk to some of the census takers in mainland China, and for people in places like the U.S., the U.K., and Australia, the national census generally involves someone knocking on your door and asking you for the official form you're supposed to have filled in. How does it work in China? Well, I think in generally. The the knocking on your doors part is the same, but it's just you know China's population is super large, so it involves a lot of resources and manpower. So, for instance, according to the government, there are about、uh, more than seven million people, including census takers and volunteers, involved in the whole process. Seven million—that's like the entire population of Hong Kong City being employed to work on this census for China. Staggering, it, indeed.、Um, So I did a story about how they conducted the census on the ground. Basically, I interviewed two census takers: one in the urban areas, the other in the rural areas, because you have to understand it's very different to knock on people's doors to do that. In urban areas, you know, every you live in a complex、um, apartment buildings, that's relatively easier. You know, in rural China, they announce you know big、um, news through a loudspeaker. Uh, you know, everybody hears a loudspeaker across the village, so they would just say, "Hey, you know, there's a census, 
and uh, everyone is needs to be part of that. And uh, if you come, then we will, you know, give you some freebies. Freebies? What kind of free stuff? Very simple stuff. You know, um, it's like a bucket. Rice. Bucket, yeah. And you cannot disclose what you're gonna give away because what if they don't want a bucket? You know, <laughs> they would just not come. You know,、right. they. So, so this is the, their way to persuade people to come. Um, and also, one of the so、yeah. do these incentives do they exist in overseas countries as well? I mean, at least I haven't heard of them in previous Hong Kong census. I'm I'm not sure about other countries, but I think in, it's particularly true in rural China because、um, you know you barely you barely hear this this kind of、uh, stuff in、um, urban cities. One of the big differences was、um, last year, the latest round of census. They Collect all the data through、uh, a system、um, hosted by WeChat. Every census taker get your information and、uh, submit it through the the system digitally. And、yeah. so, for our overseas listeners out there, tell us again what is WeChat. So WeChat is a is a very、uh, powerful messaging platforms. You can basically do everything. You play games. You pay everything on WeChat. Um, it's、uh, very commonly used on the mainland, and now it's being used for census taking. Yes, so this is the first time they did this because in the past, according to the census takers that I talked to, they would、uh, in the past they would you know write down all the information and、uh, they would type it out on the computers and then send it to the upper level government who will then you know collect and do all the you know add ups and stuff. Which will lead to some mistakes sometimes. During this round of census, they, they introduced self-reporting. The census taker will give you a special QR code because there is a special QR code assigned to each household, and then you scan the barcode and then you、um, uh, you fill out all the information. There are, for everybody, there are twelve basic questions you need to fill out, and then you submit it. Then you are done. In your story, you quoted this expert He Yafu. He was described as an independent expert on China's demographics. What did he tell you? He basically said,、uh, you know, China's total population could fall in 2022. This is based on his estimate that the the, the new birth number will be less than、um, 10 million by then,、mm -hmm. and because the death number is pretty, you know, flat, it's about 10 million. So he thinks the total population will fall. Basically next year, but、um, this is just one expert estimate. The Chinese government, also、um, the National Health Commission, basically, which is、uh, in charge of all the, which used to be in charge of the、uh, family planning, one-child policy. So their estimates、uh, from late、uh, November or October, late last year, said that the total population could fall in twenty twenty-seven. Basically, in six years.、Mm. So, as you can tell, people are prepared for the population to fall. It's only a matter of time. In two years, five years, seven years. Why is this such a touchy subject for China? Why is it so hard for them to、um, admit that population is dropping? Well, first of all, it has everything to do with the policy making. You know, China is a planned economy. Probably the only one in the world.、Um, Probably, <laughs> right?、Um, they, I mean, they just recently issued the latest five-year plan. Like, so it has everything, you know, what they plan to do, and the population data is the key here because we know that China society is aging, right? If you want to build more, you know,、um, retirement homes, how many do you need to build? You know, how many hospital beds do you need to put there? Also. Because in the census data, there are population, you know, change in each province, that will affect affects the、uh, the policy making from each province too. So Sydney, the most famous plan China is known for is this one child policy, family plan.、Um, the policy officially ended six years ago, which we talked about just then. But can we talk more about it? And I want to ask you. Even though it ended six years ago, the birth rate hasn't exactly climbed accordingly. And why is that? And what are you hearing from experts on China about this, you know, th th this phenomenon?、Um, 
So to be fair, after so the the one child policy officially ended in 2016, and in the two or three years after that, the the birth rate and uh, does uh, did uh, increase quite a lot because you know um, people as people expected there there are a lot of people who wanted to have a second child, but quickly after um, 2018, the new number of babies started falling quite quickly. I mean, one of the reasons is that, first of all, as many experts have said, they relaxed it, the birth policy so late, too late. Also, the uh, you know the cost of raising a baby, raising a child in China is increases quite a lot these days. What are you hearing from experts in China about this topic? So, as you could tell from the data, after they introduced the two-child policy into the 2016, the you know the birth rate did increase. For two years, and but quickly started falling after 2018. So, a lot of people think that they, you know, they relax too late, and maybe now is the time um, to fully liberalize the birth policy. You know, allowing people to have whatever amount of children they want. Um, and interestingly, last month, the uh, the People's Bank of China. Um, which is normally, you know, their main job is to, you know, manage the the monetary policy and uh, financial regulation and stuff. And they published a working paper that basically called for um, relaxing the the birth policy. Um, and because they said they use very simple words in conclusion, which is quite rare in an academic paper. Um, they said, you know, we should allow. Just let people who want to have children to have whatever uh, amount of children they want until it's too late, you know. Because as you, uh, as we know, um, the cost of raising a kid is quite high in China these days. We've got Zhou Xin with us, our political economy editor for the South China Morning Post. He's also the co-host of China Geopolitics podcast. So Zhou Xin, uh, the Chinese government just released a census this morning. What are the major takeaways of this census? Okay, thank you, Mimi. As you just said, you know, uh, China reported this uh, census results. This is a once in a decade census. And the number was a little bit surprising because a few weeks ago, remember, Financial Times had this front page exclusive saying China's population has started to fall. But apparently, National Bureau of Statistics, after their um, repeated delay today, unveiled the number, and it showed an increase. 1.41 billion, basically. And this uh, is already cited by the spokesperson of the Statistics Bureau saying, you know, China's market will remain huge. China will remain as the world's most populous country in the world. So this is, uh, you know, in terms of population size, this is a business as usual. But behind the headline figures, there are uh, lots of interesting changes. So number one is, of course, uh, aging population. The aging population is not uh, uh, stopping. In fact, it's accelerating. I mean, more and more Chinese people are getting above the age of 60, which will have a big challenge for the country's pension system and healthcare system. That's why the Chinese government is talking very loudly about extending the retirement age. And even it's hugely unpopular among the people, you know, because it has no other choice. China have to do it. It's like a, it's a similar situation in Japan, only the size and the speed of the aging is much uh, bigger and faster. And it also changes the way people spend money, right? Consumption habits. Yes, exactly. Because, uh, you know, in general, you know, young people spend more, you know, especially if you're in 20s, you know, you have loads of money to spend. You want to get married, you want to start your family, you have the kid, you know, to buy a new apartment. But if you're retired, you know, you, have, you basically, you know, you're wearing your clothes that's possibly purchased 20 years ago and you're having no interest to buy the latest iPhone, you know, these kind of things. So they have huge, uh, you know, implications for the Chinese economy, for China as a consumer market. So Zhou Xin, the population of China has grown to 1.412 billion and the population is aging at the same time. But what does it mean when we are seeing a repeat of a repeated decline of birth rate? That's another very interesting question. And this number actually did not include in the official documents at the press conference. And this is the last question that the official finally gave the answer saying uh, last year in 2020, despite the COVID-19, China had new births of 12 million. And 12 million sounds a lot, but it's actually a very small number compared to China's overall population, which means, you know, uh, the overall fertility rate, even by the official 
estimate it's about 1.3, which means one couple or one uh, you know woman only give birth to one in average 1.3 baby uh, throughout her life. So this is uh, this is actually uh, quite bad because uh, by natural rule, uh, this number has to be 2.1. In other words, you know, uh, one woman has to, in average, has to give 2.1 babies so that the overall population can stay stable over the long term. 1.3 is very, very uh, a dangerous figure, which means the, uh, the, the, the new births rate is very low and uh, China is going to see the shrink of population uh, down, the, down the horizon. Yeah. So how does that birth rate stack up to other developed countries? Uh, well, China, China's uh, new birth rate, 1.3, will be among the lowest in the world, and especially in the cities. I mean, in like places like Shanghai, it's already below one, possibly. So this will be a huge challenge for the Chinese government. So we are, we are going to see a huge a sea of change in, in terms of family planning policies in China. Because in the last four decades, basically from the one-child one child policy to two-child policy, the focus of the Chinese government is about restricting births, you know. Uh, I often cited this example of Zhang Yimou, uh, the most famous Chinese film director. He was fined by like millions of yuan by the Chinese government for having unauthorized kiss. But now, possibly, if you know, twenty years later, uh, the same Zhang Yimou could be rewarded by huge amounts of money from the Chinese government for having more babies, you know, than than than, than normal. So it's an interesting shift, and this uh, this means uh, a, a lot uh, in terms of business, in terms of family structure. And if you go into Chinese cities in these days, you know, most of the it's like Hong Kong, the the, the flats are getting smaller and smaller. But basically, it's like two bedrooms. Okay, and uh, and one bathroom and uh, one kitchen, one balcony. Possibly that's a standard, but how can you feed like four kids within such a such a small space? So this is this will be have lots of uh, uh, implications for even for city uh, uh, urban planning, and for for instance. In places like in, in the northeast, in the Rust Belt zone, I'm going to mention this regional imbalance of Chinese population. Heilongjiang has lost six million people. Um, you know. Mostly because of uh, domestic migrants, they are moving into the warmer places in, south, in, in the southern parts of the country. So all these schools, primary schools, middle schools there, would be struggling to survive on themselves because there are not enough students. It's exactly like uh, in, the, in the rust belt in, in the United States and in, in the UK. The similar problem that China has never dealt with before. Now it's going to, all going to be suddenly mushroomed up. So for for the Chinese government sitting in Beijing, they are going to see not not because like the city have too many people, or they are going to see this city is in decline, that town is in decline. So population are shrinking here and there, and 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 you can see increasingly the the whole population are, are concentrated in the rich coastal areas in Guangdong, in Zhejiang, and also in warmer places, maybe some places like Hainan. Fascinating summary. You mentioned in Heilongjiang province, there is an outflow of population due to domestic migrants. And in particular in that province and the northeastern part of China, there is for the first time a report of increased uh, population for, for, for females. Can you explain why? How does that tie into the um, outflow of domestic migrants uh, to, from colder places to warmer places like Sanya in Hainan province? Maybe in terms of sex uh, ratio, at least according to the population uh, census, uh, the ratio is a little bit, you know, stable, but it's still overly in, imbalanced towards like more men than women in China. There's still uh, uh, the the total gap was still over 30 million, so that's a lot. But uh, the good news is that it's not worsening. So which means you know a Chinese people. Uh, increasingly, you know, traditionally, uh, a Chinese family prefers sons uh, rather than daughters. But increasingly, I think uh, many, especially for urban and well-educated Chinese people, I think daughters will be the same, treated as same, you know, uh, as, as sons. So, so you're we, saying the, the gender gap is being gradually being closed? No, not closed. It's stable, mm-hmm. but it's not worsening. Uh, speaking of domestic uh, um, migration, that's a very big change. Uh, we t- we see two types of uh, domestic migration and because according to the uh, you know the official measures they, they measure people like whether you are living in the place that you registered with the government so for this group of people for those who are not living in the place where they registered with the government uh, this size has been uh, increased to almost 500 million and among these, there are two groups of people. Like one group is is like in the uh, the United States in the 1960s or 1950s. People are increasingly living on suburbs. 
you know, they keep their, their, their house registration in the downtown area, maybe for better uh, access to education or for health care. But they are actually living uh, in further, further away from the, from the downtown areas. In, in Beijing, uh, also, I have lots of friends who have ex- experienced, you know, this kind of change in the last couple of years. Because uh, in Beijing, in the downtown area, it's too crowded. And so lots of, uh, you know, shanty towns are redeveloped. And so they're just moving to bigger places in the suburb, having a, a you know, nice, nice apartment or even have a house. This, this is the case you know, going on in all, almost all major Chinese cities. In Shanghai, the same, right? And of course, the second is the cross-province uh, uh, migration, which is more uh, obvious. This is a, a, a very clear trend that the whole population in North China, which means in north of the Yangtze River, are shrinking. And the population in south part of uh, the, the Yangtze River are growing at much faster uh, speed. This is typically because of the, uh, uh, I mean, economic development. There are certainly more uh, economic chances, a more vibrant private economy, and also, you know, a better climate. So one thing that we uh, we, we can use as a side evidence is uh, to look at the top GDP Chinese cities. I mean, Beijing is basically the only northern city that is still among the top 10 Chinese uh, uh, cities in terms of GDP. And uh, for this situation, I don't, I don't think the government has a clear plan how to balance uh, this. You know, this could be an opportunity, but it, it means more efficient use of resources. I mean, if there are more factories uh, in, in Guangdong, if there are more job opportunities in Guangdong, for sure there should be more talents in Guangdong. But at the same time, in a, in a nationwide point of view, the widening regional uh, development gaps could be a problem for the central government. What does the census tell us about the population of foreigners in China? Oh, well, that's very interesting because uh, the first answer, short answer, is that the foreign population, the foreign community in China, remains to be very small. In a country of 1.4 billion people, the foreign community, including uh, Hong Kong, including people from Taiwan, it's only 1.4 million. And that's uh, quite a small number. If you think of uh, you know, if you think of the foreign community in, in other other countries like the United States or even uh, in, in Europe, but still it's growing. It's uh, it's uh, not a huge uh, growth, but still it's uh, growing compared to ten years ago. By which, how much? Uh, by like thirty percent. Okay. It's not bad. However, the interesting thing is about uh, the uh, you know the distribution of the foreign community. Mm. Uh, first of all, we can if by source of the. Uh, immigrants into China, we can see that more and more Hong Kong people, more and more people from Taiwan are living on the mainland. And in terms of foreign nationals, uh, it's also gross. But interestingly, like the foreign community, uh, the population in Beijing and Shanghai have both shrunk in the last 10 years. And, and we can cite this to the possibility of COVID-19 because it's, it was conducted in, on uh, November last year. And uh, the, the COVID situation is still very serious to lots of people, maybe you know, expats maybe just uh, going back home and they could return. Still, we can see that in Guangdong and in Zhejiang, the foreign community has been growing very rapidly. And I think in Guangdong, they didn't provide the city breakdown, but I think Shenzhen certainly contributed a, a lot. Because when people come into uh, China, they, they, they can see that, you know, in, uh, possibly in Shanghai and uh, Beijing, there are more and more restrictions on, uh, on, on foreigners working or living there. But in Shenzhen, there are possibly more and working you know, and, 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 and even lifestyle <laughs> opportunities for a foreigner coming to China. So that's very interesting. We've waited a month for this executive summary to come forth. Zhou Xin, what is to be announced in days of weeks after this? Well, thank you, Mimi. It's indeed a, a good question because uh, this is lots of lots of people are, are wondering, we're, we're wondering, like, why it takes so long for the National Bureau for Statistics to release the data. And uh, in a nutshell, we can say from the figures provided by Chinese government, Chinese people are still, you know, a huge population, but they are getting older, uh, better educated, uh, but and further away from home. And for the Chinese government, I think these trends, you know, whether you you say are oh, the f- one point four one billion figure may be a little bit too large than you know previous day es- estimates, but these trends are there. So for the Chinese government, what it has to do is already you know, it's already written on the wall. First of all, it has to find ways to handle the aging population. And secondly, the government has to find ways to encourage people to have more babies. And this will be a huge challenge uh, compared to the last of, uh, four decades of restricting births because encouraging births has proved more difficult to do so. 
And uh, according to all the experiences in, 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 uh, around China or in Europe, you know, Taiwan, Japan, uh, South, South Korea, Taiwan is the region of China, South Korea, Japan, and Europe, you know, it's very difficult. And then, as I mentioned, this is a regional, huge regional uh, imbalance. And so maybe the Chinese government will have to uh, tweak its uh, administrative structure. And in, in places with uh, fewer and fewer people, uh, you know, will, will it still make sense to keep the same amount of government employees as it is in uh, uh, Shenzhen? I mean, in, in, for instance, a district in, uh, in Shenzhen, Nanshan district, right? It's, it's as rich as a country. But maybe if you find a county in uh, remote provinces like Gansu, and the possibility of the population was so small, but if you still have like the two same set of uh, uh, government employees, it doesn't make sense. So it would be a, it'd be a challenge for the, for, for the central government to handle these kind of uh, situations. Fascinating. Thank you so much for digesting the executive summary for us today. And we look forward to um, more interesting stories coming out of the census. Thank you. As critical news stories emerging from China continue to shape lives and business around the world, the weekly SCMP Global Impact Newsletter brings you expert analyses and insights on the economics of COVID-19, society, technology, and the environment. Sign up to receive your weekly email at scmp.com newsletters. China's population is, as Zhou Xin has summarized, getting older, better educated, and further away from home. Much of the world's media coverage about China's census has been about a looming demographic crisis from a low birth rate. As you have just heard, it is the same crisis that countries like Japan, South Korea, and Germany are facing. But of course, none of these countries have ever had a one-child policy. It is important to remember that the one-child policy started in the year of 1980 and finished just five years ago, meaning the children born during this policy are now mostly in their 20s and 30s. And growing up as a single child during this time has had a huge impact on how they feel about raising children and starting families. If you've been following our recent episodes of Inside China podcast, you might remember our International Women's Day special looking at some of the issues facing women in China. Let me take you back to the episode and the interview I did with one of our reporters, Qin Cheng, talking about the women who are now in their 20s and 30s in China and the challenges they face. So we're basically talking about a generation of women uh, that is growing up under the one-child policy. The policy started to implement really strictly from the 1980s. So the women now we're talking about growing up in that environment. They grew up as the one child, but they also experienced one of the most miraculous economic ride in recent history. China's economy really grown leaps and bounds in the last 40 years, and they witnessed that. So their expectation for a family, for what they want to provide for their kids, have grown as well. At the same time, China is also getting very unequal. So a lot of young people are having difficulties of getting an affordable housing. If you want to give a child a good future, you want to make sure that you have a good house and it is in a good school zone. Uh, with great schools. And, and those, those places aren't cheap, um, especially in the first tier cities like Shanghai or Beijing or Shenzhen. Uh, we're, we're really talking about 500,000 to a million dollar properties. You know, it's, it's a lot to ask for from any young people. They're feeling that they don't really have that to provide for a child. So why have a family? This is really interesting. Can you tell us more about this generation uh, who were born under the one-child policy? Do you think there is a deeper cultural change in this generation's attitudes to marriage? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I have a lot of uh, women friends who told me that they don't quite feel like they want to have a family because they don't want to deal with uh, the man's family, uh, their in-laws, and, and they also feel like they have to sacrifice so much uh, from their job potential 
to to raise a family. Also, China has becoming so unaffordable that almost most of the family would want two parents to work at the same time. So double income in order to give a kid a good education and to live a decent life. So I think young Chinese women these days really find the traditional family setup very unattractive. And that is very, very evident in major cities. In smaller cities um, or in towns or villages or rural China or in rural areas, that tendency is less so. You find people tend to get married and, and have children at quite a young age because life in uh, smaller cities and smaller places in China are still somewhat affordable and manageable. But in bigger cities, people just don't find it attractive to have a family. It's more of a, I mean, you, you should probably think about it as, a, as an investment. People see having a family as doing investments and they're not seeing a good return at this moment if they live in major Chinese cities. Apart from lowering the birth rates, there was another major side effect of the one-child policy, and that was changing the gender balance for China. After 35 years of restricting and punishing people to enforce this policy, there are now an estimated 37 million more men than women in China. But Qin Chen says the daughters raised during this one-child policy, the women who are now in their 20s and 30s, have a very different outlook on life than generations before them. When you have majority of the family only have one child, the family have to treat women sort of as their only hope. They have to invest in them. They have to, you know, give them all the opportunities. So that in turn creates a generation of women who became really economically powerful and educated. They're earning more and they're becoming very independent because they're becoming financially independent. And that in turn gives them a strong yearning of taking back control of their life. You know, marriage is no longer Chinese women's only option to get a better life. Chinese women are now working in all kinds of jobs earning a livable wage and having that second thoughts on whether they should be hurried into a marriage or sacrifice their own career growth. So all of these things are very powerful awakening. Um, and I think they're affecting Chinese women's choices. That's Beijing-based journalist Qin Cheng speaking on a previous episode of Inside China we published back in March as part of our International Women's Day coverage. Since then, we have been documenting other social changes in mainland China. And although it didn't get a mention in this morning's executive summary of the 2020 census, one of the stories we published earlier this month speaks directly to the concept of marriage and how a new generation of Chinese women are, well, there's no other way of putting it, just not happy about marriage. Every 10 years, China conducts its national census. But every year, the National Bureau of Statistics conducts a postal survey of 100,000 households. Last year, 20% of the women surveyed said they regretted getting married. That's more than double of the number who said the same back in 2009. And if you're wondering what's the number for men, you know, who regretted getting married, go and guess. That's 7% Chinese men, who made up 51% of the population in mainland China, are pretty happy with how things are going. But the reality is quite obvious. In the year of 2019, the number of divorces as a percentage of new marriages in China hit 50%. That's before the pandemic hit. And even then, the divorce rate only dipped slightly to 45%. That's more than double than what it was in 2009. And of those divorce cases, more than 70% were reportedly instigated by women. It's a kind of journalism cliche to use a quote from Mao Zedong when doing stories about women in China. His proclamation was that women hold up half the sky. It is starting to look like a more accurate quote for China is happy wife, happy life. Because women might hold up half the sky in China. But if the number of divorces and the declining birth rate are any indication, 
modern Chinese women are getting much less than a 50-50 deal when they marry. But that's all we have for you this week for Inside China. Thanks for following us and sharing us on social media. Please keep up to date with more news from the 2020 China Census and everything related to China at scmp.com. My name is Mimi Lau. If you want to follow me on Twitter, find me at gzmimi. And until next time, keep the mask on, keep your social distance, and please, if you can, book in and get your vaccine. Bye for now. For more podcasts from the South China Morning Post, head to scmp.com, where you can hear more about technology, trade, culture, and society.